Today we're going to look at the 1920s and the war. So World War One is over and people are going to return and they're going to start uh, shifting from a wartime economy to a consumer economy and people are ready to buy. This area, era is often known as the, the Roaring Twenties. Um, it's going to be a time period where there's sort of this clash of ideas. It's going to be a time of social and political change. The first thing we want to look at is sort of the economic policy. And of course, the president sets the economic policy. And during the beginning of the 1920s, the president was Calvin Coolidge. And he sort of had this idea of just sitting back and watching the nation prosper. And you might even not really know who he is because he didn't do a whole lot. And that's sort of the economic policy that he had. The government was not supposed to be involved. And this idea of not getting involved um, in economics is called laissez-faire laissez or hands-off. So the government is not going to set rules and regulations. It's not going to tell you um, what to pay your workers. It's very much free markets and capitalism to of uh, to the extreme. So big boom, big business is going to take advantage of this, and business is going to start booming. And was not a lot of consumer goods. Most of the goods were being um, produced were for war: tanks, bullets, weapons, that sort of thing. And they were being sent overseas. And so people back home, remember, were asked to, to ration and to not to drive if they didn't have to, that sort of thing. So people are going to shift. There's going to be a shift from producing items for war to items for uh, personal use. And this idea of the 1920s being a consumer society. A lot of times people didn't have money to buy all the goods that they wanted. So for the first time, you're going to see people start to use um, credit or it's, the term sometimes is used is installment plans. So if they wanted to go buy uh, a car, they wouldn't save their money as they did before. They would go out, take out a loan, buy on credit or use these installment plans. And what, one thing that made all of this consumerism possible was mass production. So during the war, they were using mass productions to produce weapons and clothing, and they used this same assembly line and uh, idea to produce consumer goods. So that's really important to know that the assembly line allowed for mass production goods. So what kind of things are we talking about that came out of the 1920s? Um, cars, of course, are going to be the big thing. They change everything. They change where people live, how goods could get from farms to cities faster. Suddenly, you know, you didn't have, it didn't take uh, days to get from one state to another. You could just get in your car and go. It's just going to change, you know, even simple things like how we dated. Um, medicine's going to be changed with the invention of penicillin for the first time. It's going to, penicillin saves thousands and thousands of lives. We just think of if you have a cold, you go to the doctor, you get an antibiotic. But before the 1920s, you didn't even have penicillin. So that's inc an incredible breakthrough for medicine. Something simple like a refrigerator. Before Here, if you wanted to keep something cold, milk, anything, you had to go and use ice to keep stuff cold. You had what's called an ice box. Air conditioners. Can't imagine living in the South without an air conditioner. The dishwasher and the washing machine, of course, are going to change uh, things for women and give women more time so they don't have to spend their washing clothes. So the 1920s really was a time when there was great inventions and people were willing to buy the stuff. And of course, the car, there's going to be this development of a mass culture. Um, and what do I mean that by that is that everybody's doing the same thing. 
We take that for granted now because we all watch the same television show, we all look at the same pictures on Facebook. But back then, if you lived on the East Coast, you really didn't have an idea of what was going on in the West Coast until the invention of radio and, and to some extent to movies. People began listening to the same radio stations and they began watching the same movies and that helped to develop the mass culture. Nationwide advertising began to develop, so people were listening to the same ads, so they began buying the same goods and um, off-the-rack clothing instead of homemade clothing. They began doing some of the same dances using some of the same slang. And that was new. Before then, it was a much more segregated culture. Of course, Hollywood is going to come into its own. You've got black and white movies. People are going to have extra money. During this time period, like three-fourths of people would see a movie a week. It really was sort of this um, classic Hollywood. And that's going to make making the car um, faster and cheaper and more available to the average person. And the car is going to lead to something called urbanization. And you need to understand what urbanization is. It's when people are able to move around easier and they move into cities. And so for the first time in the 1920s, you're going to have more people living in the city or urban areas than living on farms. Um, this is going to lead to sort of clash of ideals, right? Like the people who lived in cities were seen as sort of uh, liberal, more progressive, maybe a little bit scandalous, whereas farmers were going to be seen as conservative and traditional values. But people did also, when they started moving, they moved into more segregated neighborhoods. You're going to see the uh, migration of African Americans to Harlem, and they're all going to live in the same city. Um,
perspective of the age. It, it was imp it improvised and it definitely had uh, roots in the African American community and in the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance came about because of cars and urbanization. Um, there was a migration of African Americans out of the South to the North into cities. And when they got together in Harlem, they came, it was a, there was a flourishing of African American art and literature and music. And people began uh, really taking an interest in African American culture. So what are some of the push-pull factors of African American migration? You do need to know that. So some of the push factors are pushing these people, uh, pushing African Americans out of the South is racism. They're still not seen as equal. There's um, Jim Crow laws. Some of the pull factors or some of the interest things that are pulling people to the North and to the Midwest are going to be better jobs, uh, cultural uh, connections. They, they When they move and live in similar cities, there's going to be that draw. So you had this Harlem Renaissance, and some of the things that you need to know are Elaine Locke, Marcus Garvey, W. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston. These are some of the more famous people of the Harlem Renaissance. And a lot of them went to what was called the Cotton Club. And the Cotton Club was where they would get together and they would smoke and they would drink and they would play jazz music and come up with these great artistic ideas. Langhuis wrote the very famous poem, A Dream Deferred. And it says, What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? So even as they're coming into this cultural, um, sort of cultural high for African Americans in the, in the Harlem Renaissance, they still do look back on their roots and uh, segregation in the Civil War and slavery. Um, and you can see sort of this underlying sadness in a lot of uh, especially in Links and Hughes' work. So it was all for women, right? We talked about with the invention of the washing machine and the dishwasher, women weren't having to spend so much time in the in the house. And this is going to be one of those old versus new, it sort of posed a threat to the traditional role of what a woman should be. And during the 1920s, you had women shortening their skirts, cutting their hair, going to clubs, smoking. And of course, you know, it's kind of like you, if what you probably have a grandmother who looks at whatever you do and it's like, in my day, we didn't do that sort of thing. Um, and in the 1920s, women really were sort of pushing the envelope on what it meant to be a woman, and it didn't necessarily mean staying home. The 19th Amendment is going to be passed, and that's going to give women suffrage. Now, suffrage, pl don't please don't get suffrage confused with, um, with suffering. It doesn't mean that women suffered. Um, suffrage means the right to vote. So with the 19th Amendment, women are going to get more rights and they're going to be able to vote separately from their husbands. We talked about new technology and women smoking, drinking. So what are some other sort of clash of ideas, um, this old versus new? The yeah, idea of saying um, conservative versus liberalism. Conservative being the old traditions and liberalism being new and progressive. Um, so some of these clashes of ideas was with prohibition. Prohibition, of course, was the uh, made the producing and the consumption of alcohol illegal, um, and that's with the Eighteenth Amendment. You can sort of, I'm sure you already know what happens to prohibition that it was repealed, but think about it uh, like like marijuana. You know, it's it's illegal, but people still do it. And it's the same thing with drinking, right? You've got the government saying, 
no, you can't drink, but is that really realistic? They're going to do it um, in underground bars called speakeasies. They're going to have bootlegging. And it just became too expensive to enforce, right? Sort of you see that in, in states that it's just astronomically expensive to try to stop everyone from smoking marijuana. Same thing came to be in prohibition. It just wasn't uh, cost effective, so they repealed it with the 21st Amendment. So you do need to be aware that the 18th Amendment uh, instigated or started prohibition, and then, of course, the 21st Amendment repealed it. Some other social tension or social change, liberalism versus conservatism, would be in school and in science. Um, of course, we take it for granted that evolution is always taught in science classes, and we all sort of know what the theory is, but in the 1920s, that definitely went against traditional values, traditional values being um, the Bible and creationism. So during this time um, in Tennessee, there was a law that forbid the teaching of evolution, and a science teacher uh, started teaching it as, a, as an alternative theory to creation, and he was uh, brought to trial and tried uh, for breaking this law. And he lost. Um, they said that he could not teach evolution in schools, and he was fined. And this trial is usually called the monkey trial or the Scopes trial. So make sure that you know both, both names. Scopes trial is the same thing as the monkey trial, because the monkeys, of course, evolution we came from monkeys, that sort of thing. So even though this is a time of huge economic boom, a lot of you know, uh, progressivism, you can see some of the unrest, and especially some of the unrest is going to come in the form of, uh, of farms. Uh, we're moving towards the Great Depression, but the Great Depression came early for farmers because they lost foreign markets, right? During World War I, they were producing massive amounts of crops and, and sending it overseas so they could sell much, much more um, food because they could sell it overseas. But when the war ended, you know, France, Germany, and all those countries, they began producing their own food again. So that's going to be a problem. Veterans are coming back from overseas. They're coming back and needing their jobs back. So there isn't as much work available. Uh, the economic boom does provide some jobs, but unskilled workers, that sort of thing, are going to, to find it hard to find the, uh, the jobs that they left filled by, mostly by women or minorities, African Americans. During this time period, there was a backlash against unions and labor strikes. That's because of the Red Scare. And you need to be aware that during World War I, there was the Bolshevik Revolution. And the Bolshevik Revolution uh, was when the Communist Party came to power in Russia. And you need to be aware of that because it is definitely going to affect how America saw uh, labor and, and organized labor because we were afraid that the Communist Party was going to come to America. So you do need to be aware of that. So the Red Scare, and of course Red referring to, to Russia and their flag, which is red with the yellow sickle, was a fear of communism. And why did we fear communism? Well, because in communism, the state owns everything, right? This is, it's an exact opposite of this laissez-faire government not involved. It's the complete opposite. Um, there's no private property. Um, the government's going to tell you what to produce, how much to produce, what to charge. Everybody's going to be paid the same. It's the idea of making everyone equal. So the workers are going to throw over... The, throw overthrow the wealthy class and make everybody equal so they did a uh, communist party does champion workers right they want workers to rise up and overthrow the wealthy and it's going to mean that the the communist party is going to align itself with labor unions sort of supporting the workers and that's why there was this attitude of labor unions are bad they're communist that sort of thing. During this time period, there was also a, a faction or like a right-wing portion of the Communist Party, and they did put uh, bombs in 
senators' mailboxes. And this sort of started a panic that the communism coming to America was going to take take over and Palmer is going to go on raids and arrest thousands of people and deport them and say and name them as communists whether they were or not. But it slowly died out and he uh, Palmer was running for election and he even lost. So you can see it builds up to sort of a frenzy but it, it doesn't get very far. Something else that we see a reemergence of is the KKK. Hollywood put out a movie called The Birth of a Nation, and this is a picture from a scene from that movie, and it's actually set in, the, in a town in South Carolina showing uh, the Klan's members with their hoods fighting the, the African-American soldiers, and the Klan sort of uh, comes into this, this town and shows that it basically depicts African Americans as complete animals and that they rape women and it's just a terrible movie. But why did the KKK gain this reemergence in members? Why did people suddenly rejoin the KKK? Two things. First, during World War One, we were putting out propaganda America is the best, um, this is what it means to be American, fight for your country, and that resurgence of nationalism. And so people sort of migrated the next place, the, from, okay, I'm an American and I'm great, and that means to be white. Okay, so, so they saw a reemergence in members from that, but they also expanded their mission. It wasn't just a hatred of African Americans. It suddenly became a, ha a hatred of Jews and Catholics. And so they gained members that way. It's see a, a build in numbers, but it too is going to not last very long. So this fear of people that aren't American, right? Um, that we want to keep America, America, for lack of a better word, American, is going to result in some racist immigration policies that basically says that we want people who are in America to continue to be that way, meaning white, Northern European, and Protestant. So they passed the immigration quota of 1921, which limited immigration to 3% of what the census was in 1910 and then later in 1890. Now why did they choose 1910 census and 1890 census? Because the majority of people that came in during those periods of time were from Europe. Not a lot of Asians might immigrated into America during that time period. So um, very this it was very racist towards Asians. All right, so Americans are going to definitely be living an exciting time period when there's definitely a lot going on, but we can see that they we're moving towards the Great Depression, especially as people start buying and then they begin overextending their credit. Once these people reach the limit of their credit, we're going to see in the next lesson what's going to happen. During this time period, also what you're going to see is that big businesses with no uh, regulation, they don't have to necessarily pass that wealth down to their workers. So there's no minimum wage. And what's also going to start happening is that people are not going to be able to afford, even when they, when they max out their credit, they're not going to be able to afford these goods. And that's going to um, be a factor of the Great Depression as well. So definitely um, take note of the high lights and the exciting times, but also be aware that there was um, a push and pull between conservatives and liberals, and there were some, some darker things that were happening in the 1920s as well. And some things that I suggest if you want to learn more about the 1920s. Um, I really like the Crash Course website. I think that um, John Green is funny. Um, number 32 is on the 1920s. And then, of course, um, The Great Gatsby is sort of the classic book of this time period. Um, they did do a movie recently with Leonardo DiCaprio. 
I of course did a lot of research to put all this stuff together. Most of these is, are uh, citations for the pictures, but if you have an interest, you can look at these websites as well. Have a great day, and I will see you next time.